The Caucasus is comprised of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia, and intersects some parts of Russia, Turkey and Iran. It is in fact one of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots. A biodiversity hotspot is a biogeographic region with significant levels of biodiversity that is threatened by human habitation. Focusing on species and their habitat within these hotspots is considered by some as the most effective way to conserve our planet's biodiversity. You know, vultures do not have a good reputation or a good name. Um, they are associated with death, they eat dead things. Um, in, in parts of the world, they are seen as, you know, the, the evil, bad guys. People might say, oh, they are ugly, they are associated with death. But if they are not there, if the scavenging function in the ecosystem is not there, uh, death carcasses will accumulate. They are really the, 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 the nature's cleanup crew. They are the garbage men of, 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 of nature. I, I, I like to say um, that they are a little bit like the unsung heroes, very much like the garbage men of our cities. Um, yeah, so I, where, where was I? Uh, I was just saying that Georgia is, is, is a beautiful country and an important country for vultures. Yeah, we have, I would say, a lot of vultures in Georgia. Separate species like the griffon vulture, one of the uh, top species, I mean, in number, and black vulture also, and Egyptian vulture. And they are breeding mostly in east part of Georgia, but in this area we have some beautiful places with full of vultures <laughs> and one of this is one of them where we are now The Caucasus is home to 6,500 plant species, at least 25% of which are endemic, not naturally occurring in any other part of the world. The region includes nine climate zones from subtropical to semi-desert, with peaks higher than the Alps. Despite the name Eagle Gorge in the Kaheti region of eastern Georgia, it is more so a hotspot and breeding ground for vultures. Nika and Kola are here to assess the population size, breeding population, and nesting success of the griffon and Egyptian vultures. But too, to take note of other species, such as storks and snake-eating eagles. They are both interested in going beyond the metrics, observing the behaviors and lives of these species, and how they interact with their wider ecosystem. Rakteba. <laughs> we found Egyptian gnome vulture sitting on the nest and another griffon vulture nest but it's empty now but it's hard to say which nest are you photographing now? Um, uh, there's a cliff 
the cliff and uh, under there is a bush line and off on the top of this green bush there is a uh, like uh, that uh, like a V cave and it's sitting on the mother and the chick this is griffin vulture yeah this is a griffin vulture Mostly we are working together uh, and we know each other very well, we trust each other and we are happy when we are together working on birds or mammals. Uh, yeah, when uh, you are working with your friend is uh, uh, more, uh, more good. Me and Nikar. Uh, working together very comfortable because we know together uh, more than 10 years. We need to um, get a result, uh, real results. Of course we understand uh, our result uh, will not 100% true but we need to be 85% <laughs> true. That means we need to found most of the nest that is able to find by human. And sometimes, yeah, for this we are uh, risking our life. But it's also some kind of um, pleasure when you are feeling this, and I don't know. Sometimes uh, uh, you need to um, go a little bit uh, far to see more good this uh, nest or something, as uh, Nika go now in different rock and climbing there and uh, uh, if you want to make uh, your job uh, really good uh, you need uh, much climbing and much walking There are four species of vulture present in Europe, and all can be found in Georgia. The bearded vulture is known in various countries as the bone breaker, with between 70 to 90% of their diet being made up of bone. Its scientific name, Gypatus barbatus, literally means bearded vulture eagle. This majestic bird lives in the typically more pristine, higher altitude environments, around 1,000 meters above sea level. In fact, they are susceptible to a respiratory infection caused by mold spores in the air at lower altitudes. They have visually prominent eyes due to a yellow iris and deep red eye ring, and can be distinguished when flying due to their longer and narrower tails than the other vultures. They have a reported maximum wingspan of 282 centimeters. They are monogamous, meaning mating for life. Pairs are solitary and highly territorial. Bearded vultures are variably orange or rust of plumage on their head, breast and leg feathers. But this is actually cosmetic. This coloration is in fact due to regular wallowing in mineral rich springs and mud. The Egyptian vulture is a prominent species in Georgian mythology. Feces are an important part of the Egyptian vulture's diet. Eating cow, goat and sheep excrement gives them the edge in the mating game. Ungulate droppings are high in pigments called carotenoids. These pigments are responsible for the Egyptian vulture's visually distinctive yellow bill. They have a wingspan of up to 180 centimeters, the smallest of the four vulture species in the Caucasus. They are monogamous and avoid the harsher climates of the highlands. Eurasian griffin vultures are visually differentiated by their downy head and neck that look bare from afar. They have a wingspan of up to 280 centimeters, also monogamous, and they forage and feed communally. Griffin vultures arrive at carcasses soon after corvids, in particular ravens. 
which suggest griffon vultures may be reading the presence of other scavengers as a signal of relative security. The Cinereus vulture, or Eurasian black vulture, are the biggest of the four species, with a wingspan of up to 295 centimeters. They forage and feed jointly with griffon vultures. However, the Cinereus vulture can easily be visually distinguished by its uniformly darker color and feathered collar. They are also monogamous. It could be interpreted that griffon vultures take care of the flesh of a carcass, Cinereus vultures the skin, Egyptian vultures the feces, and the bearded vulture the bone. Thus, each species fulfills a role in removing potentially infectious carcasses from our ecosystems. The carcasses of dead animals are ideal breeding grounds for various deadly infectious diseases, such as anthrax, rabies, and cholera. Vultures are resistant to those diseases, as their digestive systems and high body temperatures make light work of the deadly microorganisms. For this reason, the presence of vultures minimizes the risks in epidemics in both humans and livestock. Uh, Yeah, the griffon vulture uh, probably increasing in Georgia, probably because we have not um, surveys, we have not studies after 2005. And uh, one of the real, real reason uh, why we decided to start this uh, monitoring program and uh, this study was this one because we need to know how many birds do we have and in fact of all the four continents uh, where vultures occur vultures do not occur in in australia they don't occur in Oce uh, in oceania so they occur in in north and south america in europe Afri africa and asia uh, europe is 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 the only good good news story uh, in a sense that Europe is the only continent where vulture populations are doing well. They are increasing, they are rebounding, uh, they are uh, being restored in areas where they've formally disappeared, they are getting reintroduced. Um, vulture populations of, these four, of some of these four European species have increased 200-300% in the last 20 to 30, to 30 years in some, in some places, in some regions in Europe. Elsewhere, it's dramatic. <clears throat> in India, they've disappeared almost completely because of veterinary diclofenac. Veterinary diclofenac. We'll come back to this later. In Africa, they are going down the drain. Declines of 70, 80 percent in the last 20 to 30 years. Seven species uh, on the verge of extinction. Um, they are disappearing from lar large areas of Africa. They were formerly very common there. And the situation in, in, in the Americas is also not very good. Some species, notably the condors, um, the Californian condor, but also the Andean condor, not doing very well um, and, and uh, declining in, in, in some areas. Uh, so globally, a very gloomy, a very negative picture of vultures, very dramatic picture of vultures. Uh, Europe is really the the the, uh, the good news story. Somehow this canyon holds a um, big population of griffon vultures and not only. Uh, I'm saying big because we have uh, around 20-25 breeding pair of griffon vulture here on this canyon. And for me, it's not a few number, small number. We we are founding nests and nests every year, new nests uh, in that places uh, where uh, was not used 10-15 years ago by wild vultures. I mean the griffon vultures. And uh, because of this uh, I can say the population uh, are growing and growing. But of course we need the real study to say this 
loudly and to be true and that's why we are here and trying to find out some magic things that we have here in Georgia and in Georgia it's mm, I'm, everything is uh, still wild vultures can find uh, corpse in uh, in wild and uh, they can survive we have lots of mountains and people still um, still keep their traditions for example um, we still have shepherds we still have these um, fields for grazing where there are um, sheep uh, lots of sheep and uh, some other cattle But yeah, there is some kind of magic <laughs> is this with this bird. Yeah. Do you think vultures are misunderstood? Um, are they are the main, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess they are, yeah, definitely, largely, yeah. Yeah. Of course, uh, I, I really do think that. How do you feel about this, like, the, the perception that people have on vultures versus what they are actually like as creatures? Okay, um, I perspective I'm film industry is the film industry is Sam <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Yes, I mean, uh, vultures uh, generally have got a, a bad press. Uh, they are considered stupid, like in, in general book. 
we often we often call our politicians vultures because they explore the weak. Uh, vulture capitalism is very often used, you know, this. Uh, um, and this is because uh, vultures are usually associated with death. Uh, and in our European uh, Christian, um, you know, uh, values, death is uh, uh, is usually a negative thing. Um, now, in other civilizations, in in other system of values, uh, death is um, uh, is not seen in, in the same light. And, and and in fact, for 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 many or for some, death might be sacred and might be uh, you know a, a, a milestone. And in fact, in 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 some of these ancient cultures, um, big being eaten by a vulture after dying uh, was considered a very good thing sacred because you know it would, it would transport the, the the soul to another dimension or to to uh, to another life and in fact there's been there is a, a number of old civilizations where in, indeed this practice uh, was common the zoroastrians in asia uh, built the famous towers of silence where they would deposit um, uh, dead bodies for them to be consumed by vultures, because that was that was considered uh, uh, a good thing uh, for for you know in, in, in their in their system of of, of values. Uh, in our Christian uh, you know European Western um, system of values, death uh, is, is something to avoid and something uh, you know to, to something negative, and and because vultures are associated with death. They, they get this uh, uh, this bad press. So I started reading some science magazines, and through one of them, I came across a article that was on vultures, and it said vanishing sky lords. The topic itself was so uh, uh, exciting, so I read it, and then I decided that this is the one I would like to work on. So this is how it all started. You know, our ancestors, uh, be it any religion, uh, almost every religion, they knew the importance of animals in their lives. And in India too, vultures have a lot of mention in mythology in ancient times. And even at present, the Parsian community in India. So uh, for Hindu culture, vultures were mentioned in the Ramayana and epic in which a vulture, its name was Jatayu. And it helped in, uh, uh, it tried to save a mother Sita that was being abducted by a demon named Ravan. So, you know, and it sacrificed its life in trying to save her. And later it was uh, criminated by Lord Ram himself. And we worship Lord Jatayu. It is mentioned and it is often mentioned when we talk about vultures. Ancient traditional stories, otherwise known as myth, play a significant role in culture. This culture then shapes how we perceive the environment and ecosystems around us, down to our view on and relationship with other species. But what are myths? Interviewer Bill Moyers asked professor and mythologist Joseph Campbell, are myths stories of the search by men and women throughout the ages for meaning, for significance, to understand the mysterious, to find out who we all are? Campbell responded, people say that what we are seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think we are seeking an experience of being alive. Campbell described myths as public dreams. We have uh, two, sometimes three pairs of uh, Egyptian vulture here. And this bird is a probably uh, more magic <laughs> than griffon, you know, uh, because uh, we uh, we have a, like a legend of this bird. Uh, we call them Pascunji. It's uh, just a name doesn't mean mm, some real things, but uh, probably uh, Paskunji from Georgians 
means huge birds which uh, was used our Georgian tails and these birds sometimes help the mm, heroes to get a success. The mythology of the Kartvelian peoples, pre-Christian Georgians, is vast. Georgian myths and legends are preserved mainly as popular tales and more present in the rural communities of Georgia. The Egyptian vulture has a special place in Georgian mythology. Paskunji, a mythical fairy tale bird, is described to have the body of a lion, yet the beak, wings and claws of an eagle. It moves between the underworld and the afterlife. The creature was said to be intelligent, thoughtful, and sometimes even talkative. Well, one of the stories of the main character, um, usually main character is a, uh, it is the either um, a hero who is out there saving the, um, saving a village or a community, or it's a semi-god, semi-god person who also positive, trying to save the, the local community, and this trying to save the local community usually engages in. Um, fighting the evil forces, like uh, like giants, for example, or dragons, many-headed dragons, like in many stories, you know, serpents, um, all sorts of, goes through all sorts of challenges, uh, and eventually uh, might end up in a situation when uh, when he, he's going to perish. And that's when this um, Haskunji shows up, and... Uh, and it puts the, the, the main hero on, on, on its um, back and flies away from the danger. But usually what happens, uh, he need, this Paskunji to do so needs food, needs meat. Um, uh, to fly, the, the more meat it is, the, the farther it goes and uh, it's highly likely it's going to get, make it to the safety. So, and at some point the Paskunji, and, and if a guy, and this main character, gives the pieces of meat, to, to this uh, to Paskunji, Paskunji. but uh, usually he uh, runs out of meat and what he does he cuts off his leg or a part of his leg this guy and feeds the uh, Paskunji with this meat with his flesh so thanks to this the Paskunji makes it to, uh, to the safety and that's when and, and at the end the Paskunji says usually at the, at, the, at the end of the story she says oh that last part was so delicious what was it and then the guy wouldn't say it, but the Paskunji sees the guy is uh, going away over the leap. And that's the when the Paskunji realizes that the guy gave uh, him a horror, eat the, this uh, part of his body. And then the Paskunji uh, puts the wing on this um, missing leg or a part of a leg and it, it heals back. So that's, <laughs> that's how it goes. But to be honest, I like this kind of names, Paskunji. It sounds some, how can I say, some, <laughs> some nice things, some strong and, I don't know, I, I like it. <laughs> mysterious, right? Yeah, so yeah, some mysterious. Yeah, the main thing is that uh, this kind of mythology playing a uh, big uh, role to connectivity um, wild animals and humans each other yeah so vultures are very important in various cultures in india as well and in other uh, other countries are also like tibet Sky burial is one of the ancient cultures of Buddhism in the high Himalayas of the Tibetan Plateau, also among the Zoroastrians in Parsi communities of India. The traditional Tibetan funeral ritual, also known as Jator, involves the human corpse being exposed to the open area to be eaten by vultures. It is a deliberate and culturally symbolic practice, as vultures in this context symbolize or are associated with the purification and rebirth and are considered sacred. A local specialist told me, the practice of Jator remains mysterious. Local and related people don't want to share their cultural rituals. 
Now, um, you know, uh, uh, what we've been, what we do tell people is that, um, well, <laughs> death is the only certainty <laughs> in, in our lives when, when, uh, when, uh, when we are born. We know that one day we will die. We, we might not know what we will do, where we will live, how, how, are, how is our life going, uh, life going to be shaped, but we know for sure that it's going to, to, to die. And, and, and the, there are ecosystem functions that deal with that. Um, you know, our corpse will need to be our and any other dead animal. We need to be disposed of. We'll need to be, you know, uh, managed. And vultures do that. Vultures do that admirably. Vultures do that for, for free and very cheaply and very effectively. If you've got a dead sheep in a field, and this is detected by vultures, they can clean it bare in three or four hours. And when I say clean it bare, it's clean it bare. It, nothing remains except the bones. And if the, the birdie vulture was there, even the bones would be eaten. Um, so basically, you've got a recycling of nutrients, which is extremely effective. Uh, they are really, uh, and, 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 and it's only them and a few other species of mammals that, that can do this, this job. No, no other species can do this job. And, and therefore, they are, they are an absolute needed part of the, uh, of, of the countryside and of our ecosystems. And that's what we, that's what we try to, 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 to tell people, uh, raise their awareness so that they understand vultures in, uh, in, a, different, uh, in a different light. Could you introduce the story of this specific vulture? And does he have a name? Ha'es orbi i pawa ertet ma mokalakem tuos ten sretis regionashi. Zalgats mdina espira, sretogats pechevi kona tokit chekruli. Zan paris keli tokit. Aris orbi, sakheli araoks. Da mi guachnia da utulit, aramatome tel gupilo. Aris held Kazar de Lisaura, we got some RVC. Let's say, Robert, we machine Nipoa, two Tamil Kona Bodidan, the Kazarda, the Shell of Pierce Toka Bissam, the Konda, and Taro, SAT Shuidida, SAT Rasmir Megobruli, Arunda, Ross, Essit, Sergas Ruli, Sergas Ruga Shimiva, the Orbi, Massa Seva, Miss Mukado, Didolia Shia, Preni Sunari, Titmis Argachnia. Aqsaan <laughs> I'm <laughs> Uh, vultures are, for the most part, uh, not able to hunt. Uh, they, they, they evolved uh, uh, bodies and traits and behaviors that do not allow them to hunt or kill live animals. They eat uh, uh, dead uh, carcasses. In doing so, they perform a very unique and absolutely needed ecological service, which is cleaning our countryside. They are, if you want, nature's cleanup crew. Um, uh, luckily, um, luckily, um, the farmers here and the bats don't use uh, this. Um, uh, painkillers uh, of a group of uh, uh, diclofenac, uh, diclofenac, diclofenac, non-steroidal uh, painkillers. 
if you treat an animal, a livestock with this uh, uh, seemingly uh, uh, non-harmful or innocent painkillers that humans use daily uh, to, to manage their pains and their fever, uh, and if you treat animals, livestock with these uh, painkillers, and then these animals for some reason die, and you dump them on a waste dump or somewhere else, and they get eaten by uh, vultures, the vultures die. And they need a teeny, teeny, teeny tiny amount of these residues of these diclofenacs uh, to get this um, gout disease, immediate gout disease. And because of that, uh, some 95% of all Indian Pakistan vultures died out. Luckily here, we don't use this uh, group of uh, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory uh, painkillers. But it's a, it's a matter of time, who knows? One, we don't have any uh, preemptive uh, regulations right now. So if somebody starts use, using those uh, uh, remedies, it's going to be disastrous for our vultures too. Poisoning is the number one threat to vultures in Europe and worldwide. Um, this poisoning is not directed at vultures usually. It's directed at carnivores to try to solve in a rather drastic way uh, human wildlife conflict. So in, in other words, uh, the, 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 the driver of, of poisoning is usually carnivores. In Europe, wolves, bears, lynx. In Africa, lions and, and leopards that kill uh, livestock or game species. Um, and therefore, uh, livestock breeders or hunters, they often uh, feel the need to kill the predators. A rather drastic way of, of doing it is by, by using um, uh, poison bait. So, so a piece of meat which they lace with, with a certain poison um, uh, which they put uh, on the ground uh, in order to, to, to kill the, the, the predator that has killed either the cattle or, or their, game, the, their game species. The problem with, with this is that this is an extremely uh, indiscriminate and drastic way of trying to solve human wildlife conflict, and it's illegal. It's illegal because it's indiscriminate. You basically can kill everything with that poison bait, not only the targeted carnivore, but any other scavenger or animal that, for some reason, eats the poison bait. It's also extremely dangerous because uh, it can kill humans, and there's been cases of humans killed, kids that pick up uh, a poison bait and and and, uh, and then put the, the hands in their mouth uh, or, or people that uh, when uh, handling these poisons get killed by, uh, by by accident and there's been casualties vultures get killed and vultures get killed because they are scavengers vultures by by nature are scavengers scavengers means that they eat dead meat they come down they eat uh, and they die uh, and this is the number one killer the main threat to vultures worldwide poisoning other threats, including electrocution, collisions, mostly with power lines, land management, persecution, and trapping, further undermine the stability of vulture populations. I, roughly, I, I, I can say the population of Clifton vulture in Georgia is increasing, but I can't say the same about black vulture and also um, sorry uh, egyptian vulture but uh, sometimes people are thinking this is like this blah 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 but it's not true and that's why we need uh, surveys we need the studies uh, we need uh, of course long-term surveys and then long-term plan to save the populations. Yeah, first we need to uh, study better these local populations. Uh, we need to know what are the threats, how are the populations, uh, what is the stable population, and then uh, we can uh, we can focus to keep these uh, numbers uh, stable. Do you think that? To save a species is to save an ecosystem. Yes, of course. When you are trying to save one species, 
it's not only one species indeed you are trying to save ecosystem the habitat that's held by this species so vultures a largely misunderstood species serve a crucially important function in our ecosystems they have in recent decades and continue to suffer great challenges to their existence what does the future hold uh, well i'm positive by nature and and i'm really also very um you know uh, boosted by our success story in europe it is possible to restore vulture populations if we want we can do it and we've been doing it in europe so therefore i, I would like to believe that uh, we will continue to do it in europe and we can also do it elsewhere where vulture populations um, where vulture populations have been decimated or are still decreasing if if governments if societies do not allocate the funding do not allocate the space do not allocate the um, the measures that our biodiversity needs um, then it will be uh, very very difficult and it will ultimately mean the end of uh, you know humankind as we know it uh, because indeed we are facing you know we are facing a, a biodiversity crisis and our our future depends on biodiversity depends on soil depends on uh, forests depends on all these ecosystem functions that exist and we will suffer as a, as a species as and, and and as a you know humankind so uh, but yeah i'm i'm positive um, I hope that governments and, and, and societies uh, recognize the value of biodiversity and the need for biodiversity uh, and put pressure for uh, resources uh, and regulations to be in place. We will then be able to restore vultures uh, and, and revert the very negative situation that we now have in Asia and, and in Africa. Thank you for uh, for uh, you know taking the time and, and and your interest in vultures. It's it's badly needed and it's very welcome. Uh, you know the, the the more we spread the word about about uh, their situation and and and, the, and you know what needs to be done, the better. So thank you for reaching out to all these people.